All right, here he is, general manager of the Pittsburgh Steelers, joining us from his home in Pittsburgh. I assume it's in Pittsburgh. It's got to be somewhere near Pittsburgh. Where in Pittsburgh do you live? You don't have to give us your address. We don't want anybody showing up. But what's, what, uh, what area of the town do you live in? You know what? Right now, we're right smack downtown. It's, uh, we've been downtown for two years, and it's been fun, enjoyable, and just a different part of life right now. We were in Pittsburgh downtown last summer, and it's amazing how much it's changed in just a fairly short period of time. The number of restaurants that have opened, the number of hotels that have opened, it's stunning to me because when I worked in Pittsburgh back in the early 90s, at night, the town basically went into a slumber. On weekends, nothing was going on. Now it's very lively and very dynamic, much more than it was just a few years ago, but definitely more than it was in the early 90s. Yeah, no question. I mean, there's a lot of things going on you know, with the PPG Center and Heinz Field and, and PNC Park right across the right across the water, all within walking distance. The cultural districts picked up, and, you know, with that, the convention center and some of the restaurants and hotels that are picking up around it. Obviously, we're in a little bit of a hold as, as the world is right now, but when we come out of it, it'll continue. It'll continue to grow. A lot of good going on. Well, you're a Pittsburgh guy through and through. I grew up 60 miles away, but you had a five-year detour in Miami with Coach Shula, who passed yesterday. First of all, condolences on that. But give us that first memory that comes to mind for you when you think of your time that you spent working with Coach Shula. Well, you know what, Mike? It was it was um, kind of a surreal moment, you know, as, as a young scout just coming off a of blisto position to join the Dolphins and, and to be in the same room with Coach Shula was truly um, intriguing, surreal, uh, intimidating to a certain extent. Um, but it was it was real, and I learned so much from Coach. Um, Coach was always very demanding, but he wasn't always demanding on a young scout like myself. He was as demanding on a you know a twenty year assistant coach that he's known forever. And you know he wanted when he wanted answers, you, you had to provide them. And if you didn't, um, he didn't have too much for you. But if you provided them, you better have evidence to back them up or you'd get challenged on your thinking. So, I mean, he made all of us better. And it's, you know, sometimes you just think back and, you know, you have to pinch yourself and realize you know, how fortunate you were to work for a man like that, especially at a young age like that was. Is there something tangible that you learned from working with him that you still use today? Yeah, I mean, I can remember in Clayman's day, we're talking about a player, I, I don't know which player it was, and. Um, and he just made the comment, well, when you got red paint, paint your barn red. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that makes sense. And, you know, he lived that, you know, when coaching the players that he had, and he got the most out of them. When he had the great runners, they were a running team. And when he had, you know, the great passer, Dan Marino, they were a passing team. And I, I just always remembered that. And we still use that uh, today in our own meeting. So, you know, this is what this player is. And, when we get them, that's probably what, how we should use them. And it's funny that you say that because I am sitting in a barn that is painted red because we had red paint. So uh, it works out very perfectly. You know, I, I saw yesterday that Dan Marino recalled meeting Coach Shula for the first time after he was drafted, that he'd never spoken to him before the Dolphins picked him. Now, that was because of that slide that Dan Marino had in 1983. But... Back in those days, would it have been as unheard of for a coach to have never spoken to a guy he drafted as it would be today? Um, probably, you know, it's, today we have so much more interaction. Um, we know they had combines. I don't know if they did interviews at the combine when Dan came out. I wasn't in scouting at that point, Dan, when Dan came out. But I don't think they did the actual interviews like we do them today. I don't think we started that really until the early 90s. So that part was probably missed. So um, unless a coach went out to work a player out, um, they probably didn't have that in same interaction that we do today. Well, it wasn't that long ago that you were making your picks in this year's draft, and you didn't have a first-round pick because it became defensive back Minka Fitzpatrick during the 2019 season. Brandon Bean, the Bills general manager, was in the same boat. He traded away his first-round pick for receiver Stephon Diggs, and he told me that – that he basically had to restrain himself from trading back into round one. How hard was it for you 
to not try to swing a deal to get back into round one once the name started flying on that first night of the draft? Well, you know what, Mike, we knew we didn't have the ammunition to do it. And we were very comfortable in not having a first round pick in this draft, obviously because we had Minka, but also getting to sit back and watch how this would unfold. Because when we all went into this, we had no idea what to expect. And you know, I, can't, I can't congratulate Ken Fiore and the league for doing the work that they did to make this come off as almost um, as flawlessly as it did. But we were, you know, we were very intimidated by the whole process. So not having a pick, there was some comfort in that. Again, knowing that we already had that player, but just to get to sit back and watch and know that we couldn't trade back then. We weren't trading any future picks. Uh, we were comfortable in knowing that that pick was used on Minka. And we still said we should be able to get six good players. So it worked out perfectly for you then. You could take in the first round as an observer, study what was happening, and then that gets you ready when it's time to get down to business the next night. No question. You know, if you know, the one thing we sensed was the trades. I don't know. I didn't even do a study on how many were done compared to previous years, but there seemed to be far uh, less this year, especially in the early round. People were just saying, no, we're picking I was fascinated by how teams would value potential 2021 draft picks, given this vague possibility that there won't be college football season or there will be for some teams, not for others, and how much harder that will be to scout players next year and what the value of those picks may be. Were you aware of any discussions, conversations, just as to the difficulty of knowing what a 2021 draft pick is worth until we know that there's going to be a college football season. Yeah, we never got that far down the road. Um, we were just really focused on 2020. 2021 never, we're just starting to think about it now. You know, we have our combine meeting virtually uh, in a couple of weeks and we'll start on next year's draft. But I, we, the Steelers, didn't think anything about 2021 or uh, we just felt that you know, we, we knew we had those six picks. We weren't interested in giving up um, next year's because uh, we had done some of that this past year. Obviously, we, we had given up picks to get Devin Bush in 2019. So we just wanted to settle in, do the best we could with the six that we got and hope for the best. The prospect of scouting for next year, though, has to be so done. And given the possibility, and I think the way it's going to shake out, we will see some schools play. Other schools won't play. So if you have a guy who was regarded as a better player from a school that didn't play, how does that guy get compared to a lesser prospect who you have 2020 film on? I mean, it, there's going to be so many different ways this can break and so many different ways you can evaluate guys, guys who play versus guys who don't play. I, I just feel like next year's draft is going to be even more of a crapshoot than a draft usually is. It, it could be. And, and again, we were faced with that this year. Uh, coming out of, you know, fortunately, we did get the combine in. Uh, we didn't get the pro days in except for a few in the very beginning. And we didn't get the recheck physicals that we usually do. So uh, we went into it. I think the numbers were we didn't have 40s on 74 people and we didn't have physicals on 76. And we just had to make the most of it. And we tried to do that um, under the circumstances. So as we move into next year, we have a whole bank of film 2020 and 2019 if certain schools don't have the fortune of playing maybe we have to make some of those decisions so it is what it is and we we have to adjust because again it's not unique to our sport it's not unique to our team it's not you know it's unique to the world and it's just something we're all trying to adjust to there was a report from just about four weeks ago that in pre-draft conversations among general managers and other executives, you had suggested the possibility of adding three rounds to the 2020 draft. Was that an accurate report? And if so, what was the basis for suggesting the possibility of three more rounds? Yeah, you know, what was disappointing about that, Mike, is, you know, you have what are supposed to be confidential conference calls where you discuss ideas about the draft and I did. I did make that suggestion. Why don't we think about uh, three extra rounds? And the reasoning was part of it was selfish. You know, you wanted to have a, a safety net because we're, we're dealing with less information and the more picks you have, maybe you have a little, you have a little, um, a little bit of a, a safety net again. Uh, but the other thing was it would give the young player 
the, the marginal player who didn't get his opportunity to go to a, a pro day and to perform um, that opportunity, you know, maybe there would be more players drafted and then those players would then again uh, have the chance that they might not get. Uh, the one thing that we're really missing, you know, um, I'll, I'll, is the opportunity to try out because there's no rookie mini camps. Um, that's 25 to 30 players per team on a given weekend. And, you know, last year, that's where Devlin Hodges came from. In the past, we had uh, uh, Chris Mingo, who came, uh, didn't sign with us, but he signed with Green Bay off of one of our tryouts. And then there was Terrence Garvin, a linebacker. So every year, a team might stumble upon a tryout player and you know those those players aren't having that so maybe if we ever get on the field we can think of a way to to help them because there's a big group of players that aren't getting opportunities have you gotten the situation have you gotten any indication at all kevin as to when teams will be able to get onto the field when facilities will be open any sort of a timeline no uh -uh. everything is still up in the air the only timeline we have is you know the Again, the league announced that they will announce the schedule, and then maybe something after that. But I'm sure they're they're working with local governments, and I, I'm also sure that if it's not good for 32, it's not going to be good for anybody. Well, and regardless of how many draft picks a team has, how many rounds ultimately in a draft, these young guys are really going to be behind the eight ball when training camp opens to try to get the coach's attention to earn a roster spot. So, I mean, I feel bad. Now, the veterans may have no problem with that because they don't have to worry about losing their job to some lowly drafted player who's going to have a much tougher climb from 90 to 53. But how, how do you envision this year being different from the standpoint of difficulties in evaluating whether or not these younger players deserve a spot on the final roster? Yeah, it will be harder. Um, but what we what we told all of them as as we did, you know, the video interviews that we could do in lieu of the, the visit, uh, we told them all, oh, look, do what you can, focus in on your safety, on your family's safety. Uh, football is always going to be secondary to that, and don't feel that you're missing anything because you're not. Because you you know you compared to another rookie, you're all in the same boat. You all will be able to get to your cities at the same time. And even the veterans, um, they will still be behind as well because you know they're they're not doing what they would usually do. So we just emphasize to the to the players, don't worry, don't panic, because we're all going to start whenever and you'll all be on equal footing. Again, they may have a shorter window to try to prove themselves, but uh, it, it's no different for one player versus another. So They'll just have to do the best they can. You've been modest about this in the past, and I respect that very much, but you have developed an incredible ability at finding receivers in the draft. More often than not, guys who come in the mid to late rounds. This year, Chase Claypool from Notre Dame sitting there at number 49 in round two. What is it that attracted you to him in that spot? Well, Chase, you know, again, Chase, we've been watching Chase for two seasons because as a junior, you know, there was a chance that – Maybe he'd come out early, and there was some talk about that. He decided to stay. So we had, a, we had I believe, three reports on him as a junior. Uh, we got more reports this year, same thing. He had improved. Um, so we had good grades going into the Senior Bowl. Uh, when we got down to the Senior Bowl, and, and Coach Tomlin and I got up close on the practice field and watched his physicality and blocking drills, his physicality and special teams drills, it really stood out. Um, plus, he's a 6'4", you know, 230-pound receiver that can get deep. And quite honestly, we didn't have that that threat last year. We didn't have that tall receiver. That receiver could just outrun coverage. And we've always had that in the past with a Nate Washington or Mike Wallace or a Martavis Bryant. So, again, that was very attractive to us uh, in the long term. In the short term, we know Chase will be a special teams contributor right out of the gate. And to have him there at pick 49, how surprised were you by the fact that he continued to linger and linger? I know there were a lot of receivers this year which contributed to it, but were you getting nervous that somebody was going to jump up and snag this guy before he could land in your lap at 49? Not really, because, again, there was a number of really good receivers, and some teams valued one over another. They wanted a smaller guy. They wanted a return-capable 
Um, there, it was really a, a strong group. We knew that from the beginning. So if a player like Chase was there for us, great. Um, we would make that pick. But there was options, you know. If we never go into it locked in on a guy because we, we have to – sometimes we have to take – the best available and if that player is that one that you really have locked in on great if not there would have been other players who would have been certainly able to help our team you added running back anthony mcfarland jr from maryland to a depth chart that has plenty of names and no clear workhorse like levy on bell once was what do you envision for the running back position do you see a revolving door do you see going with a hot hand or do you hope that one of these guys will will emerge as the guy like Le'Veon Bell once was. Yeah, last year they were a committee, and it wasn't a committee by choice. It was a committee by circumstance because our starter, James Conner, was injured. And, you know, James had an unfortunate, misfortunate year that he suffered acute injuries. It wasn't like it was one injury lingering week to week. I mean, it was one thing or another, and they were real. And it was frustrating for James. It was frustrating for us because the previous year when he was healthy, he was a pro bowl runner. And he's still a young runner. And what we do know is James will come in whenever uh, we get back on the field. He'll come in healthy. He'll be prepared. He'll be ready to go as he always is. And we have some comfort in that. Of course, we all have to worry about injury, but that's with any player, any position. So the group itself was trying to come together under the circumstances and quite honestly when we were down to when you take a you know a future hall of fame quarterback off the field uh, the offensive production diminishes you mentioned our ability to to find some receivers and we've been fortunate in that regard but they've also played with a great quarterback and i think that makes the whole offense better so with a guy like anthony mcfarland uh, yeah has a little different dimension than maybe some of the other guys we have uh, we have another fast guy in Kareth White who helps us with the, the kick returns. But Anthony just gives you a little change up um, out of the backfield. You know, he, people say he's small, but he's 200. He probably plays about 203, and he can run. And he's got really good short area quickness. Um, and when he finds a crease, he can finish, as he's proven. So he didn't have a great year last year. It's probably why he was available in the fourth round, because of an ankle injury. Um, but it was, it was a pretty easy pick at that point because he should be able to compliment the other guys. I don't know how much noise makes its way through the team's bubble, but there has been plenty of talk this offseason about veteran quarterbacks to serve as the number two behind Ben Roethlisberger, whether it was Jameis Winston, more recently Andy Dalton. It's been one guy after another. Where do you stand on the possibility of adding a veteran versus sticking with the, the depth chart that you have with Mason Rudolph, Duck Hodges, and Paxton Lynch? Yeah, again, when you look back over the history of Ben, when Ben was young and ascending, we had veteran quarterbacks behind him. When he became that veteran, uh, we've always had a younger younger drafted player in behind him. And that's by design because you're always trying to develop um, guys as, you know, as Ben moves into a later stage of his career, maybe you're developing the next one. You never know that. You know, Landry Jones developed into a nice backup. Joshua Dobbs did, and now, you know, Mason did last year, and we're comfortable with Mason Rudolph as the backup, and Devlin Hodges in the mix, you know, between the two of them, they were eight and six last year, and when you get into a backup quarterback situation, um, you know, eight and six, is, it's not 14 and 0, but there's some comfort in knowing that they can get you through the hopefully non-existent spell that may occur if your quarterback gets injured, so a lot of times when, you know, when you get into salary cap management and you have, you know, significant dollars in your starter, it's hard to put a lot of dollars in your backup. And we're very comfortable knowing that if, if need be, Mason and Devlin and or Devlin or Mason or even a Paxton Lynch, who's got super, you know, number one talent, um, we'll see what we've got. But we're comfortable with that right now. You mentioned the schedule earlier, Kevin. And, look, I know that every team – will have its preferences, maybe some requests from time to time of the league. What is it you're hoping to see when they pull the sheet off of the 256-game slate on Thursday night? Well, I have no idea because it is what it is. We have no input uh, other than say we'd prefer to, you know, open at home or away. I think every team can do that. I'm not involved with that, and I really – 
whatever they give us, we try, we have to make the most of it, you know. And this year will be different because of the unknowns and nobody will know. And I, I, I really don't have a preference because we can't, we can't influence it one way or another. So it's just our job to make the most of it when it comes out. Now that we've gotten through the draft and there have been undrafted free agents signed and the dust is starting to settle, what is your life like? What is it that you're doing differently than what you would be doing in a normal year? Well, you know, the, the difference is we would be preparing for a, a rookie mini camp and making sure we had the tryout players lined up to get us through that camp because usually you only had about 18 to 20 players on your roster that would qualify. So, again, we used to have 25, 30 tryouts that we had to get lined up and ready for this camp. Obviously, we're not doing that. So we always go back and we do some different studies on where we had guys graded, where they got picked, and so on and so forth. And like I said, we're moving into the preparation for the 2021 draft with our Blesto Combine meeting, which we'll do virtually on uh, May 18th. It's amazing. Even when it stops, it never stops. There's always something to do. And we appreciate you giving us some of your time because – I know you're busy all year round, and uh, we enjoy watching what you're doing and putting this team together for 2020. We wish you all the best, Kevin. Look forward to talking to you again soon. All right, Mike. You take care now. Thanks. Thank you, pal. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.